hope culminating in the United States because of what John F. Kennedy said, we will put a man on the moon. He never lived to see that. But the mission, the way this country got behind that, it became our purpose. You kids don't, you know what the moon is, but did you know we put a man on the moon? Did you guys study that in school? What grade do you study that in? Like, is that a history grade class? Is that a geography class? Is that just, but you do know it, right? How many of you were around in 1969? How many of you watched that on TV? Raise your hand. Come on. Raise your hand. How many of you watched it on color TV? Raise your hand. It wasn't in color anyway. (laughs) That was a huge feat. It was a great thing that this country did. But why as a church? Can't we in 2,000 years tell the world about one man? There are pockets of people all over this world that have never heard the name of Jesus. They've never read, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. They've never heard the story about the cross. They wouldn't know what Palm Sunday is any more than some of you who may go, oh, today is Palm Sunday. Why doesn't the church have palm fronds laying on the floor and someone riding in on a donkey or some flashing neon sign that says, Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday. Do we have Palm Sunday ice cream and hot dogs after church? It's in here. The message of the cross lives in here. And Jesus wants us to get it out there. And that's our calling. That's why we exist as a church that has a strong ministry, uh, teaching to the school-age kids, uh, ministering and caring and watching over preschool kids, uh, doing great events like Awana and Upward. And uh, this upcoming Saturday, we're going to have extravaganza. There's a box outside. And uh, if you didn't bring candy today, just drop in some money. Be a part. My point is that the church needs servants because that's who Jesus called us to be. Now, some of you are visiting with us today and and you're thinking, servant, I don't know what that means. I'm self-serving or I'd like to serve or I volunteer with the uh, Little League and I do things like that. That's wonderful. By the way, guests, we're glad you're here. If this is your first time, I want to welcome you and uh, say that there's a card just in front of you in the pew back if you'd like to take a minute and fill that out. After the end of the service, right through these double doors, there's a big wall map and a sign that says help this desk and we've got someone there they'll give you a gift and just thank you for coming yeah they may try to enroll you to serve or be involved if you'd like to but that's just who we are we want to serve we want to give we want to help we want to do because that's our nature and so we've been in this sermon series trying to understand why a guy named Nicodemus just call him Nick for short Nick was trying to find out how to get something meaningful in life And he went to Jesus, and all through the story of John, we see Nick weaving in and out of the story of Jesus. And it wasn't until just this sermon series that I understood the importance of Nicodemus in the Bible. Anybody here ever hear just a sermon series on Nicodemus and John? I don't see any hands. I've never heard one. I'm amazed at at how Nicodemus just is blended in the background of John and the story of Nicodemus being born starts out in John chapter 3. The story of Nicodemus wanting to stand up and be open and receptive for Jesus in chapter 7 and now we come to chapter 19 and Nicodemus now becomes a server, a servant. We, We don't know when he got saved or when he walked the aisle or when he prayed the prayer, or when he filled out the card, or when he did those official things. But something happened in his heart, just like many of you. Some of you are here this morning, and you're thinking, I know something's happened in my heart, but I haven't seen it on the outside. I, I know I love God, I, I really love the church and the mission, but I don't know how to serve, I don't know how to give or how to do. That's why we're here. Folks, we're here to help you learn those things. We are all about uh, turning regular people into extraordinary people, to gathering together people for one mission, to do incredible things. And I believe the church can do that. I believe we together can do that. We can be a part of God's plan to share the gospel to the whole world, but we have to be serious. We have to be realistic and recognize it's not lip service. You see, that's what the church is mostly about. 
Church is good when it comes to lip service. I surrender all. I surrender all. You hold back this and hold back that. You won't give that. You won't give this. And here's your time. And here's your talent. And here's your. Oh, I surrender all. I surrender all. You got all this junk behind you. There's no way you'd give it up. Josh just made liars out of all of us with that first opening song. We want to surrender all, but is it realistic? Is it possible? How do we do it? What's it going to take? And it's going to take sacrifice. But I'm concerned that the church, especially the church today, there's something, gossip has always been fun, right? I mean, those of you that enjoy gossip, it's kind of fun to show up and hear the latest news. Now, we know that ungodly gossip is ungodly. Sometimes gossip is just fun. You know, it's not tearing people down. But unfortunately, we've made a game out of that. We've perfected that in the church. We have become so good at gossiping in the church. We could be our own reality TV show starring Connell and, and, and Bob and, 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 and Gordy's going to mess the, make a guest appearance with, with all the kids. What's that show about that woman with all the kids? I mean, really, we are our own best reality show. This is life. And I believe I've jotted down some points. We're more concerned about spreading gossip than grace. We're more concerned about uh, being focused on salvation than service. Listen to that for a moment. I think we as a church get more focused on getting people saved than getting people to serve. Now, being saved is a wonderful thing. It's a new life. It's a relationship with God. But salvation without service is kind of like faith without works. It's dead. It's empty. We're more concerned with hope than helping. We'd rather spread gossip than godliness. Most of us choose to take the low road, the wide road, the easy road, than the road of service. Team effort. Winning one for the gospel. But that's not new because that describes the people in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago. On that Palm Sunday when Jesus came into Jerusalem one week before the Passover when he would be crucified. And what they do? They stood outside. Jesus was riding in town on a colt. They put down palm fronds, leaves, and they cried out, Hosanna, Hosanna. What a wonderful moment. What a wonderful moment. And then next week they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him. We need to be the kind of people that are there willing to serve and be a part of God's mission to change this world. They weren't. They were there seeking their own needs. Some of you here today are seeking your own needs. You've got hurts. You've got wants. It's okay. We all do. We all hurt. We all want something bigger, something better. We want something brighter. We want something that will be exciting. There's nothing wrong with that. But when all of our energy and focus is on getting something to feel a certain way, then we miss out on being someone instead of just feeling something. You have so much potential and power in you because you have God's Holy Spirit dwelling in you that all of your needs, all of your wants, all your desires, once they get focused on Jesus, it just gets consumed. It gets consumed in His power and His love. I'm not going to kid you and try to tell you that everything's right in my life. I'm as happy in every area in my life as I'd ever want to be. I'm not. I struggle, we all struggle, you struggle. But I know at the end of the day who I look toward when I struggle. And I look toward Jesus Christ. He is the yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He is the starting point in my life today just like he was the starting point in my life yesterday and he will be my starting point in my life tomorrow. That's what this message is all about, the starting point. You've got to start somewhere. You know, I got... Um, I got some lab work done last couple of weeks and 
cholesterol was up, and doctor wanted to put me on that. I don't know what that called, that medicine. That, um, yeah, yeah, that's it. I, I can tell several of you are on several different kinds. <laughs> None of us eat the way we ought to. But uh, I said to him, I said I would rather try to control that with diet and with exercise. Am I kidding myself? Maybe. Do I want to do it? Yes. Will I do it? I don't know. But I've got an attitude, and I battle that attitude. There's that that, that I want to do, and there's that that I do, and I do that that I don't want to do, and I don't do that that I want to do. And I feel like that guy named Paul. And so we're looking at today as a starting point, all right? Wherever you are in your life. Uh, we're going to talk about Nicodemus, and we're going to go through John, spend about 30 minutes on that. We're going to have a prayer time at the end. I'm going to open up the aisle. We're going to lower the lights and give you an opportunity to come and to pray and join me. And I'm going to give you advance warning because some of you, you're, you're not real comfortable with that. Either that or you don't need to pray for anything. I'm not sure which. You know, one, two, three, coming down, that's wonderful. And I don't want anybody to come down that doesn't feel like coming down. But if you feel like coming down and you don't come down, there, there's something that you're holding back on, if you could follow me. And I'm not down here just because I want you to come down. It's not because we want to show. If we wanted to show, I would have rented a donkey and uh, come in the door or something like that with the palm leaves. Uh, or I would have had someone dressed up like Jesus ride the donkey. We'd be giving hamburgers out to all the guests, or we'd be, I don't know. We're not about a show. We're about seeing Jesus in our life. We're about seeing Jesus make a difference. That's why in our school we are all about partnering with parents to see kids happier, to see kids grown up with a more healthy environment, to see kids grow up with the foundation of Jesus, to see kids grow up knowing they're confident in who they are in Jesus, to, to look at this turn into two rows and three rows and four rows, to see these kids know that Jesus means something in their lives, to see them here and to know they care, and actually to listen to me and look at me while I'm talking to them, and, and I see them taking notes. That's wonderful. They're there taking notes to remember for later. It's wonderful. On their telephones, just texting, man, I'm in church, and God's speaking, and it's beautiful, and, and worship's going on. I know what they're texting. Can I see that phone? Kids are going to be kids, but kids are going to grow up to be adults. And the problem is, in our churches, we have too many adults who act like kids. And we have too many adults in our country raising kids. We have kids who are raising kids. And that's not good for a country, no matter who we are. Our mission at North Hills is to partner with parents to see the very best out of what could be. That's our mission, to love God, serve others, and change the world. We are so glad you're partnering with us. So we've been talking about the sermon series. It's are you ready, willing, able, and stable? Are you ready, willing, and able? That means it's a finance term. Are you ready to sign on the dotted line to give your life away for that house, that mortgage? I've added stable to this. Next week we're going to look at stable. It means continuous. It means able to chart the course, stay on the path, stay on task, be on mission. And, and for Jesus, stability is not represented in the nails through his hands and his feet. You know that, don't you? You know that the nails through his hands and through his feet did not hold him to the cross. It was his love. It was his love for us. Matter of fact, if those Romans tried to get him off the cross, I think that he'd cling to that old rugged cross. He would hold on. He would not allow himself to be pulled down. So that's stable. We'll look at that next week. But this week, we're looking at, are you able to serve? Uh, if, if you've got a hand, you're able to serve. If you've got just one foot, you can do something. Uh, if you've got a mouth, you can do a lot. You're probably doing more than you ought to be doing anyway. Uh, but I have had a joy uh, being involved in Awana, and I'm not pushing Awana for any particular reason, but the first couple of years I was here, I was just swamped. I protected my Saturdays. I was busy during the week, lots of meetings at night. I said, this year I'm going to step out on faith and I'm going to give up some Saturdays and I'm going to uh, do the uh, halftime in Awanas. Love doing the halftime, that's fun. But you know what I love to do more? Upward. Upward, yeah. You know what I love to do more at Upward before, besides halftime? You know what I love to do? I love to ref. 
I love to tell those little kids what to do. It is such a sense of power and authority. Man, I walk out with that black and white striped shirt and that whistle around me, and uh, I, I just think I've been handed the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You know, I was out uh, reffing with, with Gordy, and there was another lady who was out there, and Gordy uh, came out kind of as an assistant ref because we were short one. And by the way, we're short uh, lots of folks uh, with Upward. We are. We need your help. There's so much you can do. Uh, we, we've got a couple of faithful people who sell concessions. My Lord, you, you girls, you kids involved in school, the whole school ought to be there doing concessions. Uh, we ought to see Walter and Tammy just bossing kids around, just tell them how to sell stuff and how to uh, make change and how to do a business. That ought to be an entrepreneurial reach, outreach of the, of the school, uh, doing concessions for Upward and making that a fundraiser. Uh, what a great opportunity. I mean, these are opportunities. So anyway, for two years, I've been looking for these opportunities in the office and going to meetings and busy. I said, I'm getting out. I'm doing fun stuff. And as soon as I saw Gordy with his little blue shirt, I thought, Gordy's just not official. Gordy, you weren't, man. I mean, I saw you over there, and I knew that you were reffing. I know you know more than I know about basketball. I mean, I know about this much about basketball. Gordy you knows like, oh. But I looked at him, and he just didn't look official to me. Nicodemus, through the gospel, did not look official as a believer or a servant. He was behind the scenes. He was soaking it in. He was getting Jesus. And then we see him turn into a servant. And that's what this is all about. It's all about us as a church turning people into servants. I want you to turn to your Bible in John chapter 19. I want to read this. And then we're going to review quickly about old Nick in uh, chapters 3 and 7. Then we're going to hang out a little longer in chapter 19, then we're going to have a prayer time. That's when I'm going to invite you. If God's working in your heart, lead the way, step out, be part of the mission, come and pray, let people know what they need to know. And uh, we'll have our prayer time, then we'll finish the service out. But in John chapter 19, here's kind of the culminating text. This is the last written word in the Gospel of John about Nick. As we'll see next week, he is stable because much is written about him, and we see he is key in the work of the church, but he remains behind the scenes like most of us should be happy to do. John chapter 19 and verse 28. Uh, this is just at the time that Jesus is on the cross. He's been there for a few hours. We don't know the exact time frame. It's just before he's going to give up his last breath. And in verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was finished, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was there, so they put a sponge, and they dipped it in the sour wine, and they put it on a hyssop branch, and uh, they held it up to his mouth. That was cruel, cruel. When you're thirsty, you don't give someone vinegar to drink. Folks, this was not them being nice. Jesus took that soured wine. I imagine he let it drip down his beard and kind of wet his outer lips. And after that, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And verse 31, since it was the day of preparation, that means it was the day to get ready for the high feast or the Sabbath day. It was the day of preparation. And the bodies, bodies could not remain on crosses over the Sabbath, this was a Jewish tradition. It was not a Roman tradition. It was the Sabbath tradition. What they would do is they would go and they would collect all the bodies and they would uh, usually just throw them in an ox cart and they would cart them out and throw them into the garbage dump because the Bible clearly says, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So criminals were not allowed to be buried. We're going to see next week that because of Nick's and Joe's interference, that's Joseph of Arimathea, and Nicodemus, because of their interference, uh, Jesus' body was placed in a tomb after it was on the cross. So what they did was the Jews went and they asked Pilate that they would break their legs uh, so they could be taken away. Well, when someone's on the cross and they're kind of on a nail and they're kind of on a stand being held up, they're able to lift up and take a breath and then drop down, lift up and take a breath. 
and then drop back down. So because their legs were stable, they were able to keep breathing longer. So they had the soldiers come along and break the legs of all those on the cross. By breaking the legs, of course, they just collapsed and they would die almost immediately because they couldn't take a breath. So one on each side, their legs were broken. But when they came to Jesus, it says in verse 33, and saw he was already dead. Folks, you've got to believe this. You have to believe it. The world is skeptical that Jesus died. They want to believe in the swoon theory that he just kind of fell asleep into kind of a coma, but then woke up in the tomb. They want to believe that he didn't really die. It was just a myth. The story was made up. Jesus Christ, a human man who was fully God, died on a cross for you and me. And it's proven here. This is historical record, just as, as proven as any historical records we have written over 2,000 years ago. People say, oh, the Bible is just a conglomeration of a bunch of written things, but there's no truth there. That is so far from the truth. The Bible is the most trustworthy document that we have in archaeology in those days, and any reputable scholar in archaeology will tell you that. It's very specific. It's very clear. Not only is it the word of God, it's the word of truth. Well, the soldiers broke the legs on the left and the right. Jesus, they saw, was already dead. They did not break his legs. Isn't that interesting? Because the Bible says that in him was found worthy who had no broken bone in his body. Anyway, they didn't break his legs. But what they did do was one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. Maybe he just didn't really believe that he was dead for sure. It's kind of like you see a sleeping dog and you kind of poke it. You know, your wife's nice and, and, and taking a great nap on Sunday afternoon. You go over and kind of poke at her shoulder. Are you sleeping? She wakes up like, why would you wake me up? Anyway, they, they did. They kind of just poked him to see if he'd move. But they poked him through and blood and water came out. Again, that fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. And it says that he who saw it bore witness. That's John who wrote the gospel. And John's testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that we all may believe. And of course, these things took place so that Scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones was broken. And other Scripture says they looked on him who they have pierced. Folks, that was written a thousand years ago before Jesus was even born. Like, wow, that was written that not a, a bone will be broken. They'll look on him who there appears. This is the suffering service servant. This is all about Isaiah 53, talking about Jesus. It's miraculous. Why can people choose not to believe? I don't know. It must be they want to do what they want to do instead of being a servant and do what God wants them to do. So in verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, but secretly, now, we criticize people who want to follow Jesus secretly. We do. We want to say, oh, you got to be bold. you got to step out. you got to speak up. you got to talk about Jesus. you got to get up on the doorsteps in the front of people's face. you got to get up on a soapbox. you got to scream out. Well, there is truth in acknowledging Jesus without a doubt. But there's also truth in speaking about your faith in appropriate ways, in ways that will draw people who are hurting to him. So Joseph of Arimathea, he was a disciple. He was secret follow, secretly following Jesus for fear of the Jews. Well, he goes and he asks Pilate if he can take away the body of Jesus. We'll get into this more next week. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took his body away. And then we see Nicodemus in verse 39. Now, in chapter 3, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. How can I have eternal life? Jesus said, well, you've got to be born of water and born of the Spirit. Nicodemus says, how can I be born of the water? How can I go back to my mom, be born again? Jesus said, no, 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 no. That's not how you get eternal life. Yes, you have to be a human being, but you also have to be born again. That's what we learn about that. Something has to happen to us. We have to have a God encounter. We have to have an encounter with Jesus that changes us from who we were to who we are now, to someone who cares more about ourselves, to someone who cares more about Jesus to someone who is not a servant, to someone who is a servant. 
And that's what's happening in this text. Nicodemus is going through that change. Chapter 7, Nicodemus then goes before all the Pharisees and says, Pharisees, look, it's not lawful to condemn a man without letting him have his say. We've got to let Jesus have his say. Well, they turned immediately on Nicodemus. But Nicodemus is following Jesus through the shadows. And now here's Nicodemus. So they've taken away the body to be buried. And Nicodemus, who had earlier come to him by night, came and he brought a mixture of myrrh and alloys, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen clothes, bound it tight. A dead person could not survive binding a body, a mouth, a face, a nose with linen cloth with 75 pounds of all of this spice covering him. And they took the body of Jesus then according to the burial custom of the Jews. And uh, in the place where he was crucified, that's the garden, nearby in a garden tomb that belonged to Joseph of Arimathea. End of verse 41. He was laid where no one else had been laid before. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Here's what I want you to uh, remember, if nothing else. Play on words. It might be easy for you to remember. Being a servant is the decision that turns the disciples into donors. Now, we use the word servant a lot in church. We use the word servant a lot in restaurants. Uh, my daughter was a server for a while at Applebee's. My son was a server at TGIF. He's a server at Cheesecake Factory. We understand servers work for tips. They work for money. It's their jobs. It's no different than you working in an office for your employer, except you're working for a salary. So servers who work in restaurants, they're not really servants. Servants, the state of a heart. It's not the outside appearance of what you do. And so what I'd like to say or be able to convince you is that to be a disciple, we have to have a heart to give that eventually becomes a heart that gives out. Now, everyone here, your heart's going to give out on you. You know that, don't you? There's going to come a day, unless Jesus returns before then, that your heart's going to give out on you. I wonder how many of you are true disciples, true citizens of the world, true people who care, and you want to keep on giving even beyond your grave. I wonder how many on your driver's license have a little orange circle, and inside that orange circle it says donor. Anybody here? I looked at my license recently and realized it was an older license and didn't have it. I had to go online and make sure my body was considered a donor body. I have no use for this body after it's old. I know my wife's got no use for it. She could set me up in my fancy chair and prop me up there and keep makeup on my face and keep my hair glued down so it won't fall out anymore. And she could change my shoes every now and then to make it look like I went somewhere and came somewhere. She could walk in the door. Oh, hey, honey, how you doing? Oh, you haven't moved since I last came here and I'm dead as a doornail. You can do that to my body. You could paint it up. You could fix it up. You could clean it up. But the truth is, it's going to give up. Heart's going to give up but I want to keep on giving beyond the grave. That's why my wife and I, my daughter's not here, my son's not here, my wife and I don't tell them. My wife and I have built into our will that when the last of us who survives dies, 10% of everything we have goes to the church. Amen? Anybody else do that? Don't be boastful, but don't raise your hand. But, you know, you can do that. You can keep on giving your tithe beyond the grave. And my Lord, if you come every Sunday and you've given to the work of the church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, why wouldn't you want that to continue past your grave? We've got someone, her name's Judy Logan. She's a lawyer. She works at the California Convention. She will come and help you set up an irrevocable trust for free. Did you hear me? I said for free. As long as you donate 10% of whatever you have left to a Southern Baptist organization. How hard is that? Do you really want to keep giving beyond your living? Do you really want to be a servant that has been a disciple that knows what it means to be a donor? We're going to look at three short points about what it means to be a servant. Uh, 
We're going to be looking at servanthood and salvation because you have to be saved to be a servant of God. Uh, we're going to be looking at the importance of, of being a servant, but also being in that walk called sanctification. In other words, you truly can't be a servant unless you're being sanctified, which means you're walking with Jesus. And we're going to say being a servant or servanthood involves being sincere. We have too many insincere servants. Too many people who want to serve for their own good. Too many people who want to get something for their own selves. So if, if you could stay with me for those three points, then you're doing great. Uh, first of all, a servant begins with servanthood. When Jesus came to Nicodemus, Nicodemus said, I want eternal life. How can I get eternal life? And what did Jesus say? You must be born again. Something's got to happen to you on the inside out. You've got to be changed. Being born again does not mean you walk the aisle and you pray to prayer. It does not mean that you uh, sing a song or, or sign a commitment card. It doesn't mean that you join the church. My my being a Christian does not mean you join the church. And being a Christian does not mean your mama or your daddy was a Christian or your daddy was a deacon or your daddy was a preacher. Um, there, there is no entry into heaven on, on a family plan, folks. You, you, you just you can't go in on dad's plan or mom's plan. It's got to be your plan. That's why we love Catholics. We love Episcopalians and others. But when they baptize babies, what they're saying is, I'm going to have this baby of mine be a Christian. You can't determine that baby's fate. That baby's got to grow up to be a young man or woman to determine their own will, their own fate, their own choice. So it begins with salvation. Nicodemus came at night. Yes, he may have been afraid of the Jews. He might have been working during the day, and that's when he got off. Maybe Jesus had strict business hours during the day, and he took uh, counseling sessions at night. I don't know. Let's not make a big deal of it. He just came to Jesus. It was night, and he said, how can I get eternal life? And Jesus said, you must be. Will you say that with me? Born again. Say born again. Born again. It, it, it's a comfortable term. It's a fair term. It's not some ooh, scientific kind of scary term. It means we're born as humans in the body. We're born through the birth canal. And then Jesus confronts us and we say, I want to be born again. I want to be a new person. I want eternal life. And we accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's what Nicodemus said. Now, listen, in John chapter 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, hey, Nick, just like the serpent in the wilderness was lifted up on a pole, so the Son of Man must be lifted up for you. Now, did he have any clue what he was saying? The answer is no. Can you say no? Very good. He had no clue what Jesus was saying. He knew about the serpent in the wilderness. He understood that. But could Nicodemus ever dream that a criminal or someone who died on a cross? Because in Nick's mind, if you died on a cross, you're criminal, even though Jesus was sinless. Do you think that Nick could believe that someone who was crucified as a criminal could ever be the Savior of Israel? And the answer is no. Just like it's hard for us to believe that he who is Lord of all who needs to be served, calls to be served, the word says will be served. He was the servant of servants. So Nick watched Jesus. He watched Jesus perform his miracles. Jesus took no credit for his miracles. Jesus never put on a crown or a sword. Jesus never tried to draw a publicity crowd around him. Jesus never tried to get his name in the, uh, the, uh, the journal in Jerusalem. Jesus never cared about getting television crews to come out and to document his miracles. Jesus demonstrated humility. Nick would have heard the story about Jesus coming to the disciples with a, a towel wrapped around his waist and a wash basin to wash the disciples' feet. Nick would have seen Jesus coming into Jerusalem instead of on a huge, white, strong Roman horse on a puny little colt, a little tiny donkey. Nick would have seen these things. And Nick began to understand what this salvation is talking about. 
because Nick was beginning a walk called sanctification. All right? So our life in Jesus begins with this salvation experience, being born again. But then our starting point is sanctification, where we begin walking the walk and not just talking the talk. It's easy to come to church, talk the talk, and leave, and then all week long to walk the walk. But that's not what Jesus did. So servanthood then shadows sanctification. Servanthood like Nick is shadowing Jesus, watching what Jesus does, wanting to do what Jesus does. How do you think when it came to the body of Jesus that Nicodemus thought, hey, I've got a buddy named Joe, Joe, my friend from Arimathea, and I know he's got this really nice, carved out hewn stone tomb that he's waiting to use and he doesn't need it right now so maybe he'll let us put jesus in there and then nick gathered all these spices and all this stuff and they started to wrap him in those spices and stuff and so we see nicodemus shadowing jesus learning what it means to be a servant how many of you truly can think of a servant in your life? Can truly think to yourself, now, she reminds me of a true servant. Now, I'm sure you're thinking of at least one person. I'm talking, so I'm not thinking, but I just think about my wife if I was thinking. So surely you're thinking about somebody. What is it that person does that makes them stand out? It probably has something to do with sacrifice. Giving. Here's Nick. He sees Jesus on the cross. And what's Jesus concerned about? His mom. Says John, well, says to John, we don't see that in the Bible, but he's talking to John, the guy that wrote the, the gospel. Here's your mother, mother, here's your son. We see Jesus more caring about other people than himself. So disciples come to a place in their life where they decide they're going to be givers. Don't they? They're going to walk the walk and not be concerned about talking the talk. And their concern is going to be that they know what it means to be saved, to really have a relationship with Jesus that they're true and honest in their walk and that they're sincere. Have you run into Christians and you've just looked at them and said, you know, they just, they look phony. Have you seen some Christians that you thought just looked and acted phony? Now, you're not judging, right? Because you're not the judge. But in your mind, have you seen people or watched their lives when after a time you see hypocrisy? They say one thing, but then consistently they do the wrong thing. You've seen that. I've seen that. And we've seen people that, that, that have fallen because of that. They say they're saved. They may have walked the aisle. They may have tried to walk the walk, but somewhere they weren't willing to surrender all. They weren't even willing to sing it, much less do it. And then their insincerity was so obvious. Nick knew this. He saw people like this. And what's interesting is I'm thinking that Nick, who was not a disciple, we, we don't see anywhere that he was a follower, born-again disciple at this moment. Yes, certainly we believe he is after this. He may be or may have been before this, but we don't know. But think about Nick being there, bearing the body of Jesus, and the disciples except for John have all scattered and they're in hiding because they're afraid they're going to be found. Isn't that a contradiction? Now look at this beautiful contradiction in John. John is saying this is humanity. This is the way we are. We want to be someone we're not. Only Jesus can make us who we are, not to be who we are want to be and peter hadn't gotten it yet peter was not born again sitting outside looking at jesus and standing by the coal fire listening to the cock crow there's 
I, nobody could be a follower of Jesus or a believer of Jesus or a born-again believer without the blood because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. So I don't want to get the cart before the horse or confuse you, but Peter just in my mind didn't get it yet. I hope you can at least see my point. The other disciples except for John didn't get it yet, but here's Nicodemus who got it. But there's no clear evidence that he was one of the followers of Jesus. Now we would see after Jesus was raised from the dead, they would all get it clearly, without a doubt. But look at the lesson that Nicodemus had that Peter did not have. Look at the lesson that I've had in a life that maybe you haven't had. Or you guys down here, the lesson in your life, maybe you haven't had it yet. Maybe you think you're a believer because you've kind of like prayed that special prayer you, you've walked down the aisle. Maybe you've been baptized. Maybe you're not. Maybe you're wondering about should you be or, or not. But there's going to come a time in your life that you're going to get it. I pray you're going to get it. Because if you don't, you won't. But when you get it, you're going to really feel and experience something inside that's different. And you'll know it when you do. It's like when you fall in love. None of you have a clue what love is. Now, you may think differently. But none of you have a clue what love is. But when you get it, you'll get it. That's the way it is with love. There's a mystery about it. Dare I say something magic about it? And there's something magic or mysterious about knowing Jesus. And you know it when you, when you get it. Now, your life isn't perfect after that. Everything it doesn't just go away and all your, your bad stop being bad and all your goods increase. No. You, you still deal with your issues, but you deal with them with Jesus. And, and that's what the cross is all about. That's what entering Palm Sunday is all about, is seeing the crowds can be flipped. Peter can be flipped. But here's Nicodemus. He's like an anchor sunk, sunk deep. And he stays, and he stays, and he stays. It's the story we all come to Jesus differently. And it's a beautiful story. For a reflection, what I'd, I'd like you to be thinking about now, let's transition our thoughts as we begin to look inside. And, and ask the question that if someone were to secretly be following or watching you, and I believe there are, whether you all know it or not, I, I watch all of you all the time I can. And most of the time, I don't see a lot of you. But I watch you all the time. And it's not because I'm a judge. It's not because I'm a hypocrite. I want to learn something, see something. And I see something in some of you that I want. I see something you have that I know I need because I can be rough and brash and I want to be more loving and caring. And some of you see that you need to be more administrative and, and less out in the loop where you don't care how it all happens. And we look at all of us and realize that as a team, we can put the man on the moon. We can tell the world about Jesus, but alone we can't. That's why we're a team. In the team, in that mission room, they had some geeks that loved the computers. They had other people that loved to do the countdown. They probably had a special countdown. All right, Joe, now you know, you get to do the countdown today. Really? And he practices 10, 9, 8, 10, 9, 8. In, in that mission room, everybody had a job, and it was all important. And then look at the, the three guys that got to go there, but only... Two got to go to the moon, but only one got to step on the moon first. We're not all as key to the completion of the mission as we may be the maintaining of the mission. But we're all part. So if someone were watching you, what part would you be? And how well would you be doing it? John F. Kennedy mad at those Russians at Khrushchev and said, we are going to put a man on the moon first. All right, maybe it was the moon race. Maybe it was a human thing. Maybe it was pride. Maybe it had nothing to do with life in general. 
Certainly the Bible never tells us we need to go to the moon. All right, I understand that. But this country did it. And John F. Kennedy pushed it. But he died before he saw it. Just like many of us are going to die before we see the last lost person here in the name of Jesus. But it's still our mission. And as a church, it means that we have to make you who are disciples to decide that you want to be Don, Kai, and your Calvary treasures. That's a sacrifice. Some of you have not yet got it yet. I understand that. When you do, it will make working at the City Little League Baseball infinitesimal, just menial, just insignificant compared to the importance of telling a kid that he double dribbled and kids wiping his face. We are called to so much more than what we are doing, folks. As a church, there is so much more that we could do if we all got on the team. I know some of your homes are a wreck. I know some of your finances are a wreck. I know some of your spiritual life is a wreck. I know some of you, you just look like a wreck. You know, I know you're struggling. I can see you. You're downtrodden. Your lips just being stepped on by your foot. And just, oh, woe is me. I've got this problem and that problem. Well, pick it up. You're always going to have those problems. I want to drop the lights down a little bit and just have a time of reflection. I don't know what God's saying to you, but I know he's speaking to some of you. If not, then I wasted a lot of time getting here this morning. You responding is not a way of saying, hey, Bill, good message. Yeah, yeah, you really got to me today. You responding is not telling me that. It's telling the church that we are on mission together. I ask the worship team, they're going to come forward and kind of lead us in this reflective time and going to be inviting you just to close your eyes and bow your heads for a moment and just to listen to this prayerful thought. God, am I the person you've called me to be? Am I doing what you've asked me to do? How can I serve you and be on this team tell the world about one man. Father, I pray during our prayer time that you'd move in heart. For those who need to receive you, that they might come to me during the service, after the service, go to the help desk and ask for help, for spiritual help. We'll have people back there who will have the answers to their questions. Come forward and pray. Maybe they're not even a member or a part of this church, that's okay. But to pray and to give that life, that need over to you and to worship Jesus Christ who went to the cross and died this week in remembrance for our sins that we might have our sins removed from your presence to pave the way for the empty tomb. In Jesus' name. I'm going to invite those of you who'd like to come forward. And maybe you need someone to pray with you. Maybe you need to pray by yourself. Come and give this time to God and pray that God would let you see where you need to be more servant in your own life.